In this lesson, we're going to begin our discussion of the essential elements of almost all crimes. Specifically, we're going to focus on the actus reus requirement. Right, but big picture, we say in almost all criminal trials in the United States, the prosecution has the burden of producing evidence and of persuading the fact finder beyond a reasonable doubt of the following essential elements. Right, so from very minor offenses, minor theft offenses, to very serious offenses, things like first degree murder, right, the prosecution is going to have the burden of establishing these four essential elements, right? It doesn't matter how less serious or more serious the crime is, right, with very limited exceptions, things like strict liability crimes, but exceedingly rare exceptions, right, these four essential elements are always going to have to be satisfied by the prosecution, right? And we'll talk about, as we work through this, where there might be some exceptions. For our purposes, the only one you really need to know are strict liability crimes, which we'll talk about when we get to strict liability crimes. But otherwise, basically every crime we're going to talk about, right, these four elements have to be satisfied, right? This is why we call them the essential elements, right? The easy way to remember this is we have four essential elements, right? The actus reus requirement, the mens rea requirement, the concurrence requirement, and the causation requirement, right? In other words, the prosecution is going to have the burden of establishing that the defendant committed a voluntary act or omission when there is a duty to act. Number two, that the defendant had a culpable mental state specified in the definition of the offense. Number three, that the defendant's requisite mental state existed at the time the voluntary act or omission took place. And number four, that the defendant's voluntary act or omission was the actual and proximate cause of the social harm as specified in the definition of the offense. Right, so the prosecution is going to have the burden of establishing these four essential elements. Let's take a really easy example though, right? Just to kind of flesh out what each of these are from a big picture standpoint, because sometimes these four elements are fairly obvious, right? Imagine that we have a person who goes up to another person, right? A person, we have a defendant who is holding a knife, right? And he goes up to a victim and start stabbing the victim until the victim dies, right? Well, in that case, and let's say that that defendant is charged with common law murder, right? Which has three elements, right? The killing of another human being with malice aforethought, right? But let's say that the defendant is charged with common law murder for going up to somebody and stabbing them with a knife, right? Could the prosecution establish these four essential elements? Right, well, number one, did the defendant commit a voluntary act? Well, our defendant going up with the knife and stabbing our victim is a voluntary act. Did the defendant have a culpable mental state? Right here, our defendant acted with the intent to kill. Right, that would be easy to show that our defendant had a culpable mental state as specified in the definition of the offense. Did the defendant's requisite mental state, right, that intent to kill exist at the time the voluntary act took place, right? Did that defendant have the intent to kill at the time the stabbing took place? That would be easy to show, right? Probably yes. And ultimately, we'd have to show causation. Can we trace the defendant's conduct, the stabbing, to the social harm, right? The death of our victim, right? Was the defendant's voluntary act, the stabbing, the actual and proximate cause of the victim's death? Yes, we could show that the stabbing resulted in this person dying. In that case, all four essential elements would probably be very easy to show. Right now, generally, we're not going to have fact patterns in criminal law that are that straightforward and that easy, but sometimes in real life, right, that's how it plays out, and there would really not be any real issues with these elements. So we'll talk about the issues that can come up. We're gonna break each of these essential elements down in different lessons. So in this lesson, we'll focus on our first element here, which is the actus reus requirement. All right, so we say absent limited exceptions. A person is not guilty of a crime unless his conduct includes a voluntary act, right? So we have to break down what is a voluntary act because essentially 
actus reus comes down to, the requirement of actus reus comes down to the defendant committing a voluntary act. We'll see there's some limited exceptions where a failure to act could constitute the actus reus requirement. We'll talk about that at the end. For right now, let's just assume that we need a voluntary act. Right, and the idea here is why we require a voluntary physical act of some type is we don't want to criminalize people's thoughts or fantasies, right? If you think about killing somebody, that's not a crime in of itself. Just because you've had a thought or a fantasy about killing somebody, that's not a crime. Now we'll see, if you start to take action towards the commission of that crime, you know, then at that point, well, once we have voluntary acts, you might be guilty of some kind of crime, right? And we know that crimes don't have to be completed, right? We don't need 100% completion of a crime in order to satisfy the actus reus requirement. We have inchoate offenses, which are essentially incompleted crimes, things like attempt, right? Say you go up to somebody with a gun, point it at their head, shoot, but you miss, right? So the person lives. Well, we know that's still attempted murder, right? It's not a completed crime, but you still have the action, right? We still have voluntary acts there of going up and shooting a gun at somebody. So we don't need a completed crime to have a voluntary act. Just really important to recognize from the outset, we just need a voluntary act of some kind, right? And again, the idea is because we don't criminalize thoughts, right? There's a difference between thinking about shooting somebody and going up with a gun and actually pulling the trigger, right? We criminalize the act of pulling the trigger, not thinking about pulling the trigger, right? That's the whole idea of the actus reus requirement. So again, though, let's define what a voluntary act is, right? Because this can be somewhat nuanced, right? So an act is simply a bodily movement, a muscular contraction, right? The way I think about this in my head is anytime the brain sends an electrical signal to some part of your body that causes movement, that is an act, right? So this could be pulling a trigger of a gun, contracting your vocal cords to speak, right? Blinking an eye. All of these things involve your brain sending an electrical signal to some part of your body that results in bodily movement, right? We call these muscular contractions. All of these are physical acts, right? Now, what about if a gust of wind blows, right? And no electrical signal is sent from your brain to your arm, right? Your arm is completely limp, but the wind causes your arm to move from point A to point B. Right? Is that an act for our purposes of the actus reus requirement? The answer is no, right? If no electrical signal is sent from your brain, it's not really, even though your body does move from point A to point B, it's not really an act for our purposes, right? We are looking for an actual muscular contraction, that electrical signal sent from the brain to some part of your body. Right? That is what we're looking for when we say an act, not just movement, right? Your body is moved from point A to point B. If there's no actual muscular contraction, it's not going to be an act. Right? But usually this analysis is pretty straightforward. We know what a physical act is. Usually the question is more so whether an act is voluntary or not voluntary, right? And one really important point I'm going to make before we jump into this is in criminal law, we use this term voluntary and involuntary in lots of different ways. So the context is really important, right? We're going to get to things like voluntary manslaughter and involuntary manslaughter. We're using the word voluntary differently in that context than we're using it in the actus reus context, right? So we'll see that voluntary and involuntary, just that word comes up in a lot of different places. Anytime I'm using that word, we should think about it in a vacuum. Don't get confused when we get to voluntary manslaughter and involuntary manslaughter and to different defenses and things like that. We're using this word differently in different contexts. So that can be confusing for students, but it's important to just remember what context we're actually using the word voluntary in. Here we're using it in the context of the actus reus requirement. 
And in the actus reus requirement, when we use in the actus reus requirement context, when we use the word voluntary, we, you're using it like this. We say an act is voluntary if a human being, not simply an organ of a human being, causes the bodily movement. Right, so a voluntary act can be somewhat complicated to understand. And there's gonna be a lot of different definitions out there. I think my favorite that I've seen is really separating a difference between what a voluntary movement is caused by your brain versus a movement caused by your mind, right? We have to separate what the brain causing movement is versus what the human mind causing movement is, right? So an act is voluntary if a human being, right, uh, really a human mind causes the bodily movement, not simply an organ of the human being. Right? In other words, as I'm sitting here talking right now, right, my brain is sending all kinds of electrical signals to my body. Right? Most of those I'm not really thinking about or asking my brain to do. Right now, for instance, my heart is beating. Right? My heart is moving. It's a bodily movement. Right? As defined by our act definition, right? It's a bodily movement that is a muscular contraction. My heart beating is an act, but it's not voluntary, right? Because it's not me, it's not my mind that's causing my heart to beat, right? It's simply an organ, right? My brain is automatically sending that electrical signal to my heart to beat, right? It's not me actually thinking about it. We say that for an act to be voluntary, there has to be that added step of the human actually kind of thinking about it to make it happen, right? If my arm is here in point A and I move it to here in point B, right, that's a much more conscious decision, right? I'm taking that extra step. That's my human mind working, right? It's not just my brain sending an electrical signal. Of course, that's happening, right? All bodily movements are your brain sending electrical signals. But in that instance, when I move my arm from point A to point B, I'm like in a way asking my brain to send that electrical signal. That added step makes the movement, makes the act voluntary, right? It's not simply an organ. It's not simply the brain of the human being that causes the bodily movement. It's the human being himself. The mind of the human being is causing the movement, right? So this is probably most obvious to see and where you would see this most often tested is things like seizures and convulsions, right? Seizures and convulsions are caused by muscular contractions. Those are electrical signals being sent from the brain causing the bodily movement. So they are physical acts, but they're not voluntary, right? Because your mind isn't asking, the human mind isn't asking for the bodily movements associated with a seizure or convulsion, right? Those are just happening automatically, like a heart beating, right? You don't have that next layer of control, that conscious control over those movements, right? That's not the human mind asking for your body to convulse and to seize. It's simply an organ, right? That's just your brain sending bad electrical signals, right? Causing the bodily movement, right? So one important thing too that can get kind of nuanced here is what about habitual acts, right? Sometimes you do something so many times, right? You take an action so many times over and over and over again that you're not necessarily consciously thinking about it when you do it. This would be something like tying your shoes, right? Maybe in the morning when you wake up and you put your shoes on and you tie them, your hands are moving, right? Your brain is sending electrical impulses to your fingers, but you might not really be consciously thinking about it. That's just habit. You know, classically, you might see this tested as a driver changing lanes, quote unquote, without thinking. Right? If you've driven the same route in your car hundreds of times, maybe for years and years and years, and you change lanes at the same spot in the route every time, you might change lanes without really consciously thinking about it, but we say habitual acts are voluntary acts, right? There's a difference between something that's a habit and something that's involuntary, like a seizure or a convulsion, right? So we do wanna make sure that we understand that habitual acts, we still say are voluntary acts. And this is because the first time you did that act, 
you were consciously thinking about it. The very first time you tied your shoes, you had to think about it a lot, right? To learn how to do that. Then over time, it kind of goes down and down and down. But because that was a requirement, we say it is voluntary, right? Habitual acts are voluntary acts. Next, we have time framing issues, right? So there's a really important distinction to make here. So a classic fact pattern you might see tested is a person is driving down the road, right, in their car. Let's say that this person has never had a seizure in their life. They believe themselves to be a 100% healthy individual. Out of nowhere, they have a seizure which causes their body to move and convulse in a way that causes them to lose control of their vehicle and they crash into pedestrians and a pedestrian dies, right? The answer, the question will be, is that driver liable criminally for some type of criminal homicide, right? And the answer is going to be, well, no, because the defendant did not commit a voluntary act, right? We know it's well-established law that seizures are involuntary acts, right? Now, an issue can arise, and this we saw in People v. Decina, where a person knows that they are prone to having seizures, right? In this case, the defendant was an epileptic, and the defendant knew that they had seizures frequently. Nonetheless, the defendant decides to get behind the wheel and drive. While the defendant is driving, they have a seizure, right, which causes them to lose control of the car, and they actually kill four people. Right? And the defendant tries to argue, well, that was involuntary. That was not a voluntary act. When I was having my seizure, right, those aren't voluntary bodily movements. So because you can't satisfy the actus reus requirement, I'm not guilty here. And the deal is, in this case, the court holds, well, really, it's an issue of timing, right? If you know you have seizures and you chose to get into the car and begin to drive, that's the voluntary act, right? So they said that this person could still, the defendant could still be held liable. They could still satisfy the actus reus requirement because we can just shift the time frame back a little bit, right? Well, you knew you had seizures, so there the voluntary physical act happened when you got into the car and began to drive knowing that you're prone to seizures, right? The idea being it's based on reasonableness, right? The actus reus, right? The voluntary physical acts don't have to happen immediately at the time that the social harm is caused, right? At whatever the social harm is we're talking about for the crime, right? It's not that that voluntary act has to happen at that exact moment in time. We can go back in time a little bit based on what's reasonable for the situation, right? To find that the actus reus requirement was met that's people v. Decina. Now, of course, this is reasonableness, right? At, you can't go back in time, you know, unreasonably to find their last voluntary physical act, right? You couldn't apply that in the same situation if the person never had a seizure in their life and had no reason to know they might be prone to seizures. You can't say, well, that person got into the car, right? It's unreasonable in that situation. But when a person knows that they have the seizures, that changes it. Now we can go back in the time frame a little bit to the voluntary act of getting into the car knowing that they're prone to seizures, right? So there's just some time framing issues there you'd want to consider. That's people v. Decina. Thank you so much for watching this video preview of our Legal Education Accelerator Program or LEAP for short. If you would like to see the conclusion of this video and gain full access to our entire 1L and 2L video library, integrated outlines, streamable audio versions, additional practice exams with explanations, and much more, we invite you to head over to our website and join the thousands of law students who have already enrolled. To get started with your no-risk free trial today, simply click the link in the description box below or visit www.studicata.com forward slash leap.
Hi everyone, my name is Serena and I'm currently a law student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Shiva and I'm currently a law student at Southwestern. Hi everyone, my name is Michelle um, and I am a first year student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Um, I used the Studicata study video series last semester to help me prepare mostly for contracts um, and I actually made an A plus in contracts last semester which I greatly dedicate to the Studicata video. By using Studicata to help me prepare for my final exam, I was able to score the highest grade out of my class on the final and even have my uh, essay distributed as the model answer. Not to mention I had done quite poorly on the midterm and was struggling throughout the whole course of the semester, understanding the material and keeping up with lectures. Because of the Studicata video lectures, I was able to go into my exams with a feeling of confidence. I didn't have to worry about what the rules of law were or how I was going to organize my answer to an essay question. I would absolutely recommend the Studicata series and their online course materials to anyone. Um, I think that they are not like um, professor lectures that you might find online or other outside study materials that you may encounter. Um, I think that the Studicata videos really focus on not only ensuring that you understand the material that you're going to encounter on your final, um, but they also help you to understand kind of the best method for test taking and they really break down how to approach each problem and the best ways to tackle certain methods on testing um, and I think that's really important and I think it's really special. I don't see that anywhere else um, in any of the other online resources that I've found. So I would certainly recommend Sudakata to anyone who is studying in law school right now. Um, good luck on your studying and you're going to do great. I would definitely uh, recommend Studicata to anybody watching this video. Uh, give it a chance. I'm sure, I'm positive, that you will love it, uh, that you will get a lot out of it, uh, and that you will be happy that you gave it a chance. Uh, I definitely am. I know I will be using uh, Studicata in the future. And I cannot thank Studicata enough for getting me through my first semester of law school. I will definitely, definitely continue to watch the Studicata video lectures throughout my law school career. And I highly recommend that any future or current law student do the same.